The Bernoulli equation is often a stumbling block for beginning physics students, but once you really understand it and have it laid out in the correct way, it'll become one of your favorite topics when it comes up on the MCAT because it's simply an application of conservation of energy, which is something you know quite well already. So what we've done here is we've laid out the Bernoulli equation and paired it with the conservation of energy equation down here. You'll notice that when you're considering the energy of a system, oftentimes you'll divide that into three components, the kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared, the gravitational potential energy, which is mgh, and the internal energy, which we'll represent here as work. Remember that internal energy can be heat and work, but realize that here with the fluid system, we're mostly concerned about work and we're specifically interested in PV work, which is the way that you examine work in a fluid system. Pressure times volume work is often the way that you examine this within fluid systems of liquids and gases. Now what you'll notice is that if we divide all three of these components by volume, then we end up getting the Bernoulli equation because remember that mass divided by volume equals density and so we have one half density times velocity squared and that is the kinetic energy component of the Bernoulli equation. We have rho gh which is density times gravity times the height above the ground which is the gravitational potential component and then we have pressure which is the third component of Bernoulli's equation. Later on, as you begin to work with fluid systems, um, you'll start to see that this is an optimal way to think about Bernoulli as it relates to the fluid systems. This constant K is constant for any point within a fluid system, no matter how many pipes you have, or no matter how many different levels of atmosphere that you're considering. You will find that in any system at any moment in time, this K, the Bernoulli equation, will be the same at any point throughout that system. And so your job is then to look at how is the kinetic energy, the gravitational potential energy, and the pressure contributing to this Bernoulli constant. And so we'll go through an example of a pipe-based system, and that will allow us to understand how Bernoulli's principle operates and how you can use it to solve problems on your MCAT. So as you can see here, we've drawn out an example of a pipe type system that a, a fluid is traveling through. And we can use Bernoulli's principle to understand what's happening to the kinetic, gravitational, and pressure components as it moves through the system. And so notice that again, Bernoulli's is simply a kinetic energy component, a gravitational potential energy component, and the pressure. So the way that you should probably approach this is first by looking at what is happening to the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy, notice that what it cares about is the velocity. Also, be aware that although we are including density in these calculations, density rarely changes when you're dealing with water or flowing liquids like you'll usually encounter on the MCAT. It is possible if it's air that it can be more compressed and become more dense, but that's an unlikely thing to show up. You're far more likely to have something with a constant density such as uh, water or some other type of liquid. So the first step in order to figure out what the velocity is, is to look at the volume flow rate formula, Q equals area times velocity. Remember that if it has a larger cross-sectional area, then the velocity will go down. Now this component, height, is a very simple one to figure out. You just look at how high that particular point is above this ground level of zero. And you can set zero wherever you would like it, but just make sure that you're constant with that. And uh, the pressure is usually the last one that you evaluate and you figure that out after having considered the kinetic and gravitational components. So as we move from point A to point B, what we notice is that we're not getting into something with a greater or smaller cross-sectional area. And that means that the velocity will stay the same because Q equals A times V. And Q is constant throughout this entire system. If A is also constant, then V will be the same. And so we see, as we move from A to B, we see no change whatsoever in the kinetic energy component. 
Now what does change is this, the gravitational potential energy. And so the height above zero is lower at point B than it was at point A. And so what we have with that is that at B, the gravitational component goes down. And so what happens to the pressure? We can easily figure that out now because we remember that K for every point in the system, for A, B, C, all the way through G, K, the Bernoulli constant, is always going to be the same number throughout this entire system at any point in time. And so because the gravitational component has gone down, the kinetic component hasn't changed, therefore pressure must increase in order for this number to be maintained. So now let's move from B to C. B to C is kind of complicated because we don't know quite how it's flowing, but we can look at the fact that it's getting into a smaller cross-sectional area. And remember that as it gets into a smaller area, the velocity has to increase. And so our kinetic energy from B to C will go up. From B to C, the height doesn't change at all, so we have no change there. And uh, this one, pressure becomes a bit complex because we don't have exact values, but pressure will do something between B and C uh, in order to make sure that the Bernoulli constant K is conserved. All right, moving from C to D, and let's draw a line here to clarify uh, what we're working with on this table. As we move from C to D, the one thing that we notice is that we're moving from an area with a small cross-sectional area to a larger one. And what does that mean for velocity? What it means is that the velocity will go down. And if velocity goes down, then the kinetic energy goes down. So from C to D, we're going to see a decrease in the kinetic energy. The height doesn't change at all, and so this will remain constant there. And because the kinetic energy is going down and height is remaining constant, we know then that pressure is going to have to increase so that the sum of these three things adds up to the same at point D as it did at point C. So pressure will increase from point C to point D simply because it has to. Now, moving from D to E, the first thing you always should be looking at is that cross-sectional area. And the cross-sectional area here is getting smaller, therefore velocity goes up and the kinetic energy component goes up. And so at E, we're going to see an increase in kinetic energy from where it was. Height doesn't change, but if this is going up and this is remaining constant, then the pressure is going to have to go down. And so the pressure at point E must be lower than the pressure at point D. You'll find this to be common throughout a lot of systems. If a uh, fluid is traveling faster, you'll often find that the pressure is a lot lower. And there's a reason for that. Remember that pressure was established by what we call the random translational motion of all these particles just kind of colliding and running into each other. But if something's moving very quickly, there's a lot less random translational motion. It's all moving forward in this direction, and so they're less likely to collide with each other. And so because of that, often when things are moving faster and more uniformly in their uniform translational motion, you're going to find a lot lower pressure because there's a lot less random translational motion. Let's move from E to F. What we see there is you don't really see a change in the thickness of the cross-sectional area of this pipe. And so that is not going to be different as you move from E to F. What does change is the height. Notice that the h, which is the distance from zero up to the point we're analyzing, is going to be a lot smaller at f than it was at e. And so what that means is that the gravitational potential energy component has gone down. And if this stays constant and this goes down, and knowing that we need k to be constant at every single point, Therefore, the pressure must be increasing. This is another thing you'll see a lot as you go deeper into a fluid system. With all else being equal, the pressure is going to increase as you move further down. Lastly, we move to point G, which is a lot like point E. It's around the same thickness, and so because the cross-sectional area is the same, 
the velocity is not going to be modified and the kinetic energy won't change much moving from here to there. Now the height is what is different and so we'll see an increase in the height there and what that means is that if this is constant and this goes up the pressure will have to go down so the pressure at F is far greater than the pressure at point G. And that's how you should be thinking about Bernoulli's principle. You should be thinking of it in terms of kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and then pressure adapting to whatever it needs to be in order for that K to be maintained throughout the system. So the first thing to look for is always look at the cross-sectional area. That will give you a clue as to the velocity. And if you figure out the velocity, then you know what's happening with the kinetic component. The next thing to look at is height. And as soon as you consider that, you know what's happening with this gravitational potential energy component. And then the last thing to fill in is just pressure will do what it needs to do in order for these three terms to add up to K at any point in the system. Now one interesting little trick is that we actually have a very unusual spigot here. And so we can calculate the velocity of the fluid as it flows out of this spigot by looking at the height of the water column over this. Remember that the velocity moving through a spigot is equal to the square root of 2 gh, where h is the height of the water column above where the spigot is. And so even, this is, even though this is an equation that you'll see in a lot of other places and usually be asked about directly, if it gets really complicated with Bernoulli's, recognize that a spigot doesn't have to be a straight linear thing, but it can be part of a much larger system. But the bottom line is that if you understand the Bernoulli equation as a representation of conservation of energy, if you see all of these complicated looking terms instead as kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and pressure, which is sort of a stand-in for work, then you'll be able to understand and analyze these systems a lot more effectively and you'll be excited when you see Bernoulli's questions come up on the MCAT. So just think, kinetic energy, which is all about velocity, and remember that velocity is all about cross-sectional area, and then think about the height, the gravitational potential energy, and the pressure will follow. And you'll be good to go with any Bernoulli questions that come up on the MCAT.